All right, we're ready to go. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon and uh, good morning in Sydney. Uh, I'm Kong Yin Tao from the Asian Language and Culture Department here at UCLA. Uh, I wanted to thank the Center for Chinese Studies for organizing the event and for everyone uh, who attended the event. Um, Today, we are very pleased to uh, have Dr. Wei Wang as uh, the Center for Chinese Studies Forum speaker. Uh, Dr. Wang is uh, an associate professor and the chair of the Department of Chinese Studies at the University of Australia. He specializes in discourse studies, sociolinguistics, translation studies, and the language education. Uh, as a very prolific scholar in Chinese linguistics, Dr. Wang's publications have occurred, uh, appeared in many major journals, such as Discourse Studies, Journal of Multicultural Discourses, Applied Linguistic Review, Journal of Chinese Language and Discourse, and the Australian Review of Applied Linguistics, among many others. Um, Dr. Wang is uh, internationally renowned for his highly interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary research, uh, which combines sociolinguistics, uh, ethnography, and critical discourse analysis in very creative ways. His uh, 2017 book published by Peter Lang uh, is a fascinating study of how the Chinese media portrays uh, migrant workers in China, uh, showing the dynamic and evolving nature of identity uh, stance construction. And Dr. Wang's most recent projects expand to other languages and uh, communities uh, than ethnic Han Chinese with multi-year field work conducted in a remote village in Guizhou province in mainland China. And the result is a groundbreaking monograph called uh, Ethnic Identities of Khan People, it's uh, Dong, Dong Zhu in Chinese, uh, in contemporary China, government versus local perspectives. Uh, the book has just been published in uh, by Rutledge in 2021, it's a brand new book. So uh, I believe Dr. Wang's uh, presentation today is related to his most recent uh, project in this area. So um, without further ado, um, let's welcome Dr. Wei Wang uh, speaking to us from Sydney, Australia. Thank you, thank you, Professor Tao, and thank you everyone for taking your time to attend my session today. It's my great pleasure to share my recent research with all of you here. Just as uh, Dr. Uh, Tao just mentioned, uh, today's presentation is basically based on my recent research on the restructuring of the Khan people in contemporary China. So here, let me share my screen with you. And uh, can everyone see it clearly here? So my today's topic um, is reconstruction of the Khan ethnic identity and culture in contemporary China, a discourse-oriented ethnographic study. Here in today's session, I just want to highlight some of the key findings and maybe some of the key points that, that I have covered uh, in, my, in my recent book. So let me first... Um, let you know the Khan people, that is uh, in Chinese, the Dong people in China. They are a minority uh, ethnic group whose members mainly reside in the border areas of Guizhou, Hunan, and Guangxi in the subtropical mountainous areas of Southern China. According to the China National Census in 2010, most of the Khan population of 1.87 million live in the rural areas and practice traditional intensive farming. In recent years, um, 
quite a lot of population of Khan went out of their um, um, homeland and went to the coastal areas to become uh, migrant workers there. We say Nong Mingung. So um, another very important aspect of Khan culture is their grand um, choir, that is a uh, Khan grand choir, or which is uh, intangible cultural heritage um, designated by UNESCO. That is, we say, Dong Zhu Da Ge. So uh, in quite a lot of um, TV shows, we can see Dong people or Khan people has a very high profile among various kinds of medias. But in everyday life, we didn't say, see much uh, Khan people in, uh, in contemporary China. And they are, in terms of their clothing, the language they use, the common kind of social practice are very common with the majority Han, Han, Han people. So this kind of very controversial, very highly constructed, uh, constructive kind of identity um, really attract my attention to explore how they represented or negotiated their ethnic identity in various kinds of social settings. So um, basically um, what I have done um, for my research um, is um, I go to one of the very uh, famous um, camp village in, in, in Guizhou province in China and did my ethnography kind of study there over three years and collect various kinds of um, materials, including the local government um, uh, archives, uh, media articles, um, various kinds of language signs, interview people there. Basically, I collect all um, materials, language materials or non-language materials there and then did uh, what I called discourse-oriented kind of ethnography there. And um, I can tell you um, altogether, I have collected a 65 hours kind of audio recording and which have been transcribed into more than 1,500 pages of transcription there. So um, basically my, my work is to analyze such huge amounts of data and generate various kind of uh, research outcomes here. So um, the two key um, agents that I'm looking at in this process is on one hand, the local government's uh, practices, on the other is the local minority people's practices. So um, in conceptualizing these um, findings, these data analysis, um, I draw on a Goldman's frame analysis, frame theories a lot. Here later on in Italy, I will talk about how I draw on uh, Goldman's theories in analyzing such huge amounts of data. And let me, um, sorry. Um, before I go on to talk about um, the data anal analysis and all the other kind of aspect of my research, I, I try to give you a little bit of a background. What does cultural reconstruction mean to Chinese ethno ethnic minorities? And uh, what is the background for that? So um, after the establishment of New China in 1949, there's various kind of campaigns for cultural re reconstruction for ethnic minorities. And cultural reconstruction in modern China is a concept with a very complex kind of connotations in uh, contemporary Chinese discourse systems uh, that pro promotes uh, the excellent traditional culture and uh, great uh, juvenilization of the Chinese nation. So it's basically a kind of way that the Chinese government used to, to try to consolidate um, uh, the nation uh, that they called um, um, multi-ethnic kind of state. That's in Chinese language. So um, within these kind of cultural reconstruction campaigns, that basically three stages um, after 1949, uh, we called it a 
U-shaped uh, developmental kind of trajectory of uh, uh, minority ethnic culture reconstruction. The first stage is from 1950s to 1960s. Um, it's a very prosperous kind of stage uh, that basically uh, associated with ethnic minority classification and uh, religional ethnic autonomy. That is uh, two strategies carried forward by the central government. And um, especially during the Cultural Revolution and uh, uh, until, uh, 20, uh, until 2020, uh, 2000, uh, 2000, sorry. And there's a very um, rapid kind of um, integration and uh, assimilization of the ethnic group into the majority hand. And the development of uh, minority culture reached its lowest point on the U-shaped curve. During this stage, ethnic minority culture has largely been associated with poverty, backwardness, ignorance. As Chinese economic reform progress, an increasing number of ethnic uh, minority people chose to leave their traditional land to make a living in cities. And as I just mentioned before, this group of people are known as migra migrant workers. They provide the labor force for manufacturing industry and the hospitality industries in more economic developed areas. And uh, subsequently, ethnic minority culture has been gradually coming to the attention of the people in other parts of, of the country. So that comes to the third stage, that a revival stage after 2000. And um, uh, people's perception towards uh, traditional culture getting changed. And um, this kind of change, were, um, uh, change was reflected in two very popular kind of Chinese saying uh, called the more traditional, the more modern. And the more ethnic or local, the more global. So uh, this new view challenged um, the understanding kind of underpinnings of the previous stage by seeking to establish a clear connection between tradition, ethnicity, and development. This view has been um, um, reflected in the development of the culture industry in ethnic minority areas over the past two decades, as ethnic uh, minority culture has emerged as a source of economic growth and uh, a link to the state's industrialized world. So this comes to the uh, recent 20 years kind of thing. So my research is basically based on um, uh, the, uh, this current kind of context that um, cultural restructuring has been regarded as a, as a, as a very important source uh, for economic development. So uh, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, my focus for the current stage of, of, uh, is very much focused on the discursive practices of the two agents. The one is a local government, the other is a local people. And uh, let me say a little bit more about my, my um, fieldwork site, where it is. And here's a, a map of China here, you can see. And the Guizhou province is um, located in uh, southwest of China, somewhere here. And for the larger map, you can see this uh, shared area is where Dong people uh, usually reside there. So it's uh, in the majority, uh, area is located in Guizhou, some part is located in Hunan, and some parts located in Guangxi. And my fieldwork site is somewhere at the border of Guizhou and Guangxi, and it's in the Chongjiang County in uh, Qiandongnan Miaodong uh, uh, Autonomous Prefecture in Guizhou Province, and specifically in Chongjiang, Chongjiang County there. And um, I choose one of the village, a very remote village here called Sanli village, which consists of 168 household of uh, 791 camp people living in uh, the village. And it's basically, this village is around 150 kilometers away from the uh, provincial capital city, Guiyang. So it's um, now it's still very far away. 
and um, the uh, the countryside of Chongjiang now linked by express train there, luckily. But um, from the countryside to the village, there's uh, about uh, 25 kilometers away, very bumpy kind of very narrow county road leading to that, um, that village. And here's uh, the village map there. Um, with a uh, very old um, ethnic buildings, now all wooden buildings there. I can tell you one of the very interesting uh, interesting story there. Um, when I first visit uh, that village, that uh, the local government just because they want to preserve uh, the ethnic culture, they um, prohibit the building of concrete building in the village. No concrete building at all allowed being built in, in, in the village. But for the local villagers, they want to build their own concrete, modern kind of buildings. So uh, quite a lot of, uh, you can see here from the picture, there are the old wooden buildings being seen there. But I can tell you the truth. Some of the, um, some of the villagers have a concrete kind of internal structure within, um, inside the wooden um, exteriors, <laughs> you can see there. And uh, basically, I, I visited the village for seven times um, with a total, uh, total period around, I, I think it's around six months, um, definitely um, in different kind of um, a period, in different kind of time over these three years from 2016 to 2019. And luckily, I finished my fieldwork before the pandemic. Otherwise, I, I can't finish my research there. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is uh, the book that Dr. Tao um, just mentioned to you, uh, published by uh, Rutledge uh, last year, 2021. It's actually a collaboration um, between myself and uh, one of my co-author uh, from China, who is uh, uh, Dr. Jiang, uh, who is an ethnologist, a Minzu uh, in, at, um, based at uh, the uh, Southwest University in Chongqing. And basically, um, um, he don't know English. Basically, he provide me with um, the kind of um, support from the ethnic study uh, perspective and cultural study perspective. And um, um, another very important kind of uh, link, and I, I like to acknowledge here, is that um, uh, I hired a three research assistant um, from West South University. Uh, in China who helped me to collect all the data and lived in the village uh, for the field work much longer, for much longer time than myself. And um, now let's talk a little bit about uh, what is discourse-oriented ethnography. And uh, basically uh, this kind of approach is try to highlight uh, interdisciplinary kind of efforts used to explore the interrelationship between language, individual culture, and society. It emphasized the importance incorporating ethnography into linguistic study with the aim of um, eliminating the social and cultural processes. And basically what I have uh, been using um, is a recursive kind of analysis that follow a kind of psychological kind of pattern of data connection analysis, reflection, and possible redirection of, their re of, of my research in light of these previous kind of circle of data connection analysis and reflection. So it's um, kind of a spiral kind of why that I try to conceptualize my work step by step. So I use two levels of conceptualization. And after I analyze the data for the first time, I use what I call experience near kind of concepts. That's basically the first kind of construct of reality. And then I try to use experience distant concepts to further conceptualize what I found. So um, what I found is Goldman's work um, gave me quite a lot of insights into how I can, I can do the experience distant kind of conceptualization. As some of you who are doing social linguistics or discourse analysis, uh, um, you may be uh, you you may be aware that for Goldman's work is very much used for intermediate kind of interactions between people. 
is um, very much for detailed kind of um, interaction analysis. This is what we call. But here I also found um, Goldman's was could be also very useful for us to analyze a much higher kind of level of interaction as well. So for some of the key terms that I used uh, in my research is something like strip. Strip basically means undifferentiated kind of uh, ongoing activities that is not yet uh, framed. Uh, and for frame, uh, basically um, from Goldman's point of view, it's an answer to the question, what is going on right now or at that instance? So that is any people, when you try to describe something, we try to describe what is going on, on right now, and you use various kind of concepts. This kind of concept is what in uh, Goldman's term is what he called frames, okay? You use different kind of concepts to describe what is happening there. Um, moving is a loss of control of a living agent where control is normally expected. Some people is expected to have a control of um, some area, um, but this kind of loss of control in Goldman's term is called moving. And stand is um, exhibition and of extraordinary kind of control by living agent. And later on, you can see and how um, uh, the Chinese government practice their stand over the camp people there. And the key here is basically an identifiable set of conventions by which a strip already framed or make sense of in terms of social and net, uh, net, natural kind of framework is transformed into something patterned on the original activity, what is now understood to be something distantly different. Basically, it means the conventions and rules behind this kind of frame. And reframe is a further key, a new the strip that had been previously framed and keyed. Fabrication, it's a special kind of key in which one or more uh, participants in an ongoing institution is or are purposefully duped or kept in dark as to what is really going on. Perhaps at this stage you feel, oh, this is all very abstract kind of concepts. How can I use all these concepts concept into my analysis? Here, I want to show you how I use them all together here. And based on my, my research during these years, what I found the, the key kind of, um, the most important discursive practices of the local government and local minority people basically can, 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 be, can be identified as follow. For the local government, um, they're using, first of all, intangible cultural heritage protection as a kind of um, key thing to practice a discursive practice there. Around this intangible cultural heritage, what we simply call ICH protection, they practice, they carried out various kinds of strategies, policies, various kinds of ways to help um, the local ethnic people to protect their, their ethnic culture and ethnic identity. Second one is keep frame, keep framing. And this is the key topic that I will cover. I will cover um, today. I want to discuss it later. The third is introducing ethnic culture into schools. You can see they, they crystallize the key kind of elements of ethnic culture and introduce all these kind of elements into the cur school curriculum there. This is a very important kind of discursive practice by the local government. And from the perspective of local people, and the first uh, discursive practice that I, I identify is elite fabrication. I will, I will discuss this issue later on in Italy, okay? And second one is distance and mobility experience. The distance from the homeland, the mobility experience definitely influenced the way of um, representing and negotiating their ethnic culture. For these um, specific aspect, um, when I'm doing the research, very much uh, I draw on uh, the interview, uh, research interviews, with the local uh, local uh, villages, and here I, I didn't have time. I don't think I have time to explore these aspects later. And if you are really interested in how I did the detailed kind of narrative analysis, you can see um, my my book uh, chapter four, okay, in detail there. And of course, I'm still doing further research in this regard. And then. Um, uh, commodification of ethnic culture is a very common kind of practice by local people. 
because um, just as I mentioned, the Can Grand Choir become a very popular kind of show all, all across China. And the people try to use their ethnic identity as a commodity to really uh, take advantage of their ethnic culture uh, for uh, making uh, living, uh, so for, uh, for, make, uh, uh, for making a living uh, for their life. So this is a very in, in, interesting kind of aspect as well. So for today's talk, basically, I'm uh, focusing on the key framing by the local government and uh, the elite fabrication by the local people as a key aspect that I want to share with you today. Now, let's first talk about the key framing. Um, following Goffman, uh, we interpret framing as a deliberate interpretation and purposeful kind of branding of ethnic kind of culture in the process of cultural reconstruction. So key frame in this study refers to the local government's deliberate efforts in framing the essential features of ethnic culture and developing operational kind of plan in compliance with guiding principles of the established keys. There's some established keys there behind. This is a rebranding kind of process, definitely rebranding their, their local identity and local culture um, that aims at creating a distinctive and appealing image of the ethnic culture and identity. You can see that as a kind of um, way that the local government is using to crystallize the, the key kind of features of, um, of, uh, the local, of the local area that they're governing. I can tell you the truth, for this kind of key framing, it's a key, it's a most important kind of strategy that the local government is using, is adopting there. It's basically they're taking a top-down kind of approach. Basically means the high level kind of government will be um, key frame the subordinate areas. For example, um, the provincial government will provide the key framing for the uh, prefectural uh, cities. And uh, uh, prefectural or city government will pro provide key frame for the county government. The county government will provide uh, a framing to the township of the villages there. So it's a top-down kind of approach. It's a government kind of practice there. So let's talk a little bit about the keys behind this kind of framing. What kind of keys, conventions, and rules that they have to follow? The three key, most important keys there that are identified in this reconstruction of ethnic culture in the camp, uh, camp area. One is what they call realizing the great civilization of Chinese nation. The other is inheriting the excellent traditions of Chinese culture. Still another, they're important, especially in ethnic minority area, is developing original uh, ecological kind of ethnic culture. Okay, so these kind of keys basically help the local government to frame, the, to provide the framing to, to, to the subordinate uh, government areas. So let's look at uh, Chongjiang County. This is the homepage. If you click on, if you like to search the web and click on this link, and you can see this is the homepage of the Chongjiang County government website. And here on the right top of the website, you can see uh, eight Chinese characters. Okay. In English, it basically means mystery, uh, mystical Chongjiang, a sacred land to nourish the heart. Okay, so this is a key frame actually put forward by the prefectural government, okay, Pro provided by the superior government for them. And how this local government really uh, to elaborate, to further interpret or use this kind of framing to really uh, promote the ethnic culture. We can see a little bit more here. Here, I want to show you a very short a kind of promotional visual clips that actually you can see the link here. It's still from the Chongjiang government website. I, I just downloaded from the Chongjiang government website. The whole clip uh, uh, is about more than seven minutes. I, I just, just because of the time, I can't play the whole thing to you here. 
Uh, what I like to do is just to pl play maybe two to three minutes, uh, just to give you a taste what they're doing there. This world has so many unexpected things that make 人生就像一场旅行，我们抵达，再出发百年古墓的沉香，深邃久远的记忆，在古寨的歌谣中流淌。鼓楼三百年的坚守，是先人记忆的丰碑，典藏着这淳朴岁月的芬芳，成就了这令人沉醉的人间烟火。神奇的一棵草，带给这里恒久的安宁与和谐。如果听从心灵的差遣，世界就应该被这宁静的笑容抵挡。造物者的鬼斧神工，幻化出这方威仪叠嶂，如诗如画般的奇妙天地。Okay, let me just stop here. And um, uh, sorry, there's no um subtitle there uh, for those who can't understand Chinese. But for those who can understand Chinese, there you can see, you can tell. Basically, this promotional kind of video developed by Chongjiang County. They provide another layer of key framing for their subordinate um, township there. You can see or village there, and you can see very clearly there uh, for the Zhanli village that um, I will discuss immediately after is that uh, they they pro provide another key frame for Zhanli that is uh, Zhanli Dongxiang uh, Yi Ke Chao. Ikezhao. Later on, I will I will discuss with you what is Ikezhao means. A uh, 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 a herb there, a uh, traditional herb there. And from these um from these um uh video clip, you can see they try to frame uh the Chongjiang County as um Guang Tian uh Tian Guang Lang Lang Jing uh Jing Sui Gan Tian Shen Qi the Ikezhao, 带给这啊很久的安宁和和谐。如果听从心灵的差遣，世界就应该被这明洁的笑容，呃，点，嗯，嗯，抵挡。And you can see basically, um, what they try to use a very poetic kind of language here to highlight two key elements of Chongjiang County. You can see the two key elements, and um, actually subsequently crystallized into Chongjiang's cultural identity. Hard, nourishing, and mystical. There, being mystical and being a place for hard nourishing, which reflects the local government's overall perception of their of their local ethnic culture. There, the narration combined with、uh, carefully filmed images create a powerful kind of image of Chongjiang County as a beautiful paradise far away from the urban hustles and bustles. That is originally ecological、um, cultural area that is、uh, both simple and full of mystery, and such key frame presents exactly the opposite of the urban civilization, rather than only a reflection of the rural life and ethnic culture. Each element of the video conveys a strong message of de-urbanization. There, 
So this newly developed frames has a clear uh, referential kind of characteristics that essentially reflects a local government stunt. That's a strong kind of control, basically. And the extraordinary control means in reconstruction, the ethnic culture of these minority people. It's not basically this kind of uh, mystery or hard narration kind of concepts. It's not from the local people. The local people don't know and didn't have much say in this kind of reframing kind of process, basically. This is basically the government's kind of way to reframe it, okay? To use this kind of crystallized concepts to really as a way to promote the ethnic culture. This is a very strong kind of discursive kind of practice carried out by, by local people um, for the purpose in the way saying for the purpose to, um, to promote the ethnic culture and identity. This is the key kind of um, discourse, uh, discursive kind of practice on one side. Now let's move on uh, to how the local peoples are doing, whether or not they're just a passive kind of receiver of these kind of concepts, these kind of key frames, or what their role there. Okay. So the local comments, uh, the local peoples, uh, what I identified is that um, they, they purposely fabricating the ethnic history and culture as well, okay? So um, confronted by the impact of the state power and commodification of the traditional ethnic culture, as I just discussed before, the local people have adopted their own discursive strategies rather than only accept um, the, the, the top-down kind of key frames possible. So they seek to benefit from the official key framing and the market demand with a view to securing and expanding their own space for cultural survival and development there. So one of the key discursive strategy carried out by, by local people is what I call elite fabrication. Here, what I mean, is that actually for most of the, the, the uh, camp people there, they are not very well educated. For quite a lot of people that we encountered in the village, quite a lot of them can't speak uh, Chinese Mandarin very well, okay? So for the majority of the senior people, they, they, their, their literacy level um, is very low, I should say. So but for the elite people, for the, for the uh, well-educated or the village heads, they are really the contributor of the reconstruction process. So one of the key, uh, key strategy, key discursive strategy they, they carried out is elite fabrication. So that means the elite villagers reinterpreted or even fabricated their local history for the sake of tourism development or economic development in large. So I, here I give you two examples. The first, this statue is actually a statue standing at the entry um, of the village of the Zali that I encountered, okay, that I, that I faced. When you enter the, 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 the local village, you can see this statue. This statue shows um, ancestral uh, roots um, of the Zali village in memory of the brothers of uh, Wu Zhang and Wu Li, and the uh, inscriptions below the statue reads, and you can see at the bottom of the statue that the inscriptions here. I, I repeat, I repeat the inscriptions here. You can say Xiang Chuan Yi San Liu Ba Nian Er Ye Yi Ru Ah Zhang Yi Zhu Jian Wu Zhang Hu Zhu Wu Li Liang Chong Di Blah Blah Blah. You can read it by yourself here. And in understanding and interpreting these. Um, inscriptions are identified two key elements. One is original origin of the name of Zhanli. Basically, according to this statue, and Zhanli village, just I mentioned, Zhanli, okay, is coming from the name of these two brothers, one called Wu Zhan and another is called Wu Li, okay. Actually, Based on my own understanding, or uh, my, my co-researchers' understanding, is a very clearly a fabrication. I will elaborate this point later on. And second is the exact date of the establishment of this village. They put it very clearly there, uh, 
one uh, 1368, okay, the 1st of February 1368, they got a very clear kind of date for the establishment of, of this village. So these two points, basically, first is the name of the village, Zhanli, combine the first names of the two brothers. This does not conform to the traditional naming conventions of Kan Can village at all. In Kan language, Zhanli is pronounced as Zhan, okay, Zhan. And Zhan uh, is just a Chinese characters for the song Zhan. Li is often used as a suffix in a place name in the Kan dialects of Southwest Guizhou. So Li is basically like uh, in, 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 in a uh, Han people's language in Mandarin Chinese, it means Cun Tun, okay? Nega Cun, Nega Tun. Does not have any, you know, specific meaning, just referring to, it's a, just a suffix there. This is a common kind of practice of, uh, uh, with, without no specific meaning. This, so this is the traditional naming system of Kan people. But here, and suddenly only mention, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, in addition, many legends and ancient songs of the Kan uh, people in Zhanli only mention two brothers came to the place, Jan, after untold hardships. And th th there's no legends, no oral history is told the story um, uh, uh, that has a clear name of Wu Zhang, no Wu Li. No. So, and another thing is that uh, for Wu Zhang Wu Li is a very typical Han people naming tradition with the surname plus uh, 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 first name there. So, but this kind of naming uh, uh, practice uh, adopted by Kan people in a very late stage, at a very late stage. So based on that, we can tell this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, fabrication is so clear there. They, uh, the, 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 the tradition, the origin of Sandy is definitely not from a combination of two brothers kind of name at all. This is a very clear kind of elite fabrication of their history, the first point. Second is um, the identification of the exact date of um, this village. For that, if you have a good, good um, memory of Chinese history, 1386, that year in Chinese history, there's a very big thing happening, very big. That is what? That is the opening year of the Ming Dynasty, of the Ming Dynasty. So actually we can see, um, just because for Khan people, they didn't have their written language. And all the histories are coming from this kind of oral, oral, um, oral history, and also from the uh, uh, campground choir. Okay, they use singing songs to 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 um, to pass on their history there. So definitely, this kind of exact date and year, uh, the, these elites of uh, villages purposely try to relate their own culture and history to the majority Han, yeah, to the majority Han. These um, usually in the, in the oral history, they just want to say a long, long time ago, something like that. They didn't have a very clear kind of year by year kind of written history down there at all. So we don't believe this kind of remote village has a clear kind of written history to say which day <laughs> this, this village was established at all. So it's basically a fabrication we can see, we can tell very clearly from a historical point of view. This is the first example. A second, you can see from the picture, this is the, this is the will, two will, okay? And um, people providing uh, the, the drinking water to the villagers there. Still, up to today, when I visit the village, the villagers are still using these two wills uh, for, their, for their drinking water. For the drinking water. And why they provide, and now these two wheels being named, the left one, male wheel, the right one, the female wheel. Why they try to frame like that? It's very much related to the herb, the traditional herb, mysterious kind of herb called Huang Hua Cha, called Huang Hua Cha. Literally, Huang Hua Cha means change flower herb. What does it mean? So according to the Kan legends, uh, this kind of herb can change the sex of the fetus, change the sex of the baby. Means 
if you have this kind of herb, and it, the, the, the parents can choose the sex of, of the infant. So this is definitely a legend, a mysterious kind of thing. No people approve that. No people come, um, you know, can, can really prove this kind of herb really exists. This is basically a, a, a legend kind of story here, legendary story. But for the elite people, villagers, they try to use this kind of legend and really materialize it and really try to, they definitely, um, they can't really prove this kind of herb is really existing. No. How can they really uh, try to operationalize this kind of concept? They build up these two wheel and accidentally in the village, there's two wheels providing drinking water to the local people. So purposely, they name these two wheels, one as a male wheel and another as a female wheel. And uh, purposely, uh, give the tourists a uh, kind of sense that this kind of, um, this kind of uh, fertility, uh, fertility kind of culture still existing in Zhanli. Okay, so these kind of mystery elements of Zhanli uh, fertility kind of culture refers to the widespread kind of belief in the outside world that there's a mysterious kind of herb called Huang Hua Chao, okay, which can change the sex of the fetus. And this maintain the gender balance very strangely. Okay, we can tell when we are doing our field work here in this village. Most of the family, most of the families keep one boy, one one girl in in the family. I don't know why, but uh, these kind of widely spread kind of stories telling they got a kind of herb called Hua Hua Chao. This herb is said to be closely guarded by a female healer. And the legend, no doubt, increased a mystic of Zhangli and form part of the tourist guides kind of come to it there. So uh, these two wheels accidentally exist uh, in Zhangli village were constructed to elaborate, to illustrate the narrative around Zhangli village culture. They used to provide the village a daily water supply, but have been assigned new meaning related to childbearing. So drinking water from the male wheel is said to guarantee a boy, and the uh, drinking water from the female wheel produce, produce a girl. This kind of narrative, however, oversimplified and reduced the Zhangli fertility kind of culture to gender selection culture and distort the public understandings of Zhangli culture there. But it could be used, it has been used as a very powerful kind of discursive kind of way to attract tourists. So here I give you two examples to show how elite villagers really manipulate or fabricate their, their ethnic identity and culture in what kind of way. So um, let me come to the discussion part of today's talk. That is against the background of rapidly expanding rural tourism and the state power and the local ethnic elites has played the key roles in formation of the ethnic identities and cultures there. I think these two agents, definitely other agents could play a role like the academics, okay, could play a role. And in my research, I, I, I came to re recognize that these two agents are the key players. Uh, this approach of discourse uh, oriented kind of ethnography and frank analysis can really help me to understand the rules, systems, procedures, that had shaped the orders of discourse in this specific geopolitical space. I entered into this space without any prior knowledge about uh, ethnic, uh, about care, ethnic culture and identity. I collect various kinds of discourse related kind of material as I just to show you some part of it. And uh, actually these kind of discourse um, oriented ethnography provide me with a very strong kind of uh, first hand experience of the culture and the discourse system there. And on the one hand, it highlights the power of discourse oriented kind of ethnography in observing, explaining the social role in a naturalistic and unmanipulated uh, uh, kind of way through the lenses of discourse and discourse analysis. Okay, this is um, what I'm doing. On the other, Goffman's work especially on frank analysis has provided us with a rich board of terminology that can be drawn on to further conceptualize the social realities there. This is 
my own understanding of these two parts. Okay. And this study, and uh, you can see there, review the local governments have played the leading role in planning and implementing the strategies and measures while taking key frame, framing of ethnic minority area as a common discursive practice strategy in this practice or uh, uh, process of ethnic cultural reconstruction. And on the other hand, the local minority elites has responded effectively to the government strategies and worked to enrich the connotation of the culture key frame, often by means of elite fabrication. Thus, the local ethnic elites have been not only key barriers of the ethnic culture, but also its main exponents and advocates of such key framing. So basically what I'm trying to say here is that these two agents and in real practice, they are not go against each other. They collaborate and very closely together. Okay, you can see here to manipulate or reconstruct, in another word, reconstruct the ethnic culture and ethnic identity in their own way. So that's all um, I'd like to share with you here today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wang, for the very interesting talk. Uh, now the floor is open for questions. Um, I think uh, as Esther has posted, you can uh, you can um, ask questions um, by posting on, in the chat room or in the QA uh, section. Uh, I'm not sure about the YouTube channel, live channel, but uh, I think you can, you know, at least for Zoom, you can post down, you know, in those areas. So, um, Any questions for Dr. Wang? I think you can also um, speak it up um, by unmute yourself. So maybe I'll start by asking um, Dr. Wang, uh, so you talked about the you know the government uh, higher up and then the local elite you know uh, villagers. What about your interaction with the ordinary villagers? Uh, what's their point of view? Yeah, have, yeah, yeah, have you yeah, discussed yeah. with them uh, yeah. what what they what they say? I can I can I can share with you a little bit about my experience with local villages, and um, I didn't cover anything here just because um, that part of discussion, that part of research, um, is basically drawn on my my um, research interview with local people, and um, I have uh, during my field work in that specific village, I contacted and also my my RA's research assistants, uh, contacted more than one hundred local villages. And finally, altogether 34 villages um, agreed to participate in our, in our uh, project. And uh, we interviewed and observed 34 local villages. And for these 34 villages, we categorized them into three groups because of the nature of our research. First group is what we called um, senior villages has no or few external mobility experience. Okay, this is the first group. And uh, consists of 10 senior villagers, first group. Second group is what we call people with some mob, uh, external mobile experience, but finally returning back to hometown. That means the former migrant workers, okay? They have been uh, working outside for a, a period of time. This is the larger group uh, consisting of 16 uh, villages. The last group is what we call external migrant workers. Basically means they have um, worked outside of the village for quite long and uh, most of them finally settled in large cities, coastal areas. So these three groups. And uh, in understanding, we, we, um, uh, most, for most of the participants in my research, we um, 
interview them for more than once and um, uh, collect um, uh, triangulate kind of data as well, meaning uh, we, we, we collect the information of one specific participant from other participants as well. Okay, we, we don't rely on uh, the research um, interview as a sole source of information. We take it as an interactive kind of activity or practice between the researcher and the participants. And currently, uh, I'm I'm working on a journal article, and it will be published very soon by the Source Journal, um, University of London Journal, um, Asian Journal of uh, Linguistic Ethnography. Very soon, okay, the paper will be out, and I, I analyze these three groups of people. Very interesting kind of findings there. And basically, um, the distance from the homeland really uh, differentiate their way of representing and manipulating their ethnic culture. Basically, the far away um, um, from their homeland, they, they didn't have a very clear or, or a very strong kind of sense of identification of the ethnic culture, too, especially for those who have a well established their career and life in urban areas. But interestingly, just within that group, if the people who are still using their ethnic identity as a main kind of commodity for their life, meaning the people who are still uh, part of their grand choir kind of a uh, grand uh, choir in, in Beijing or in Guangzhou, they still try to highlight their ethnic identity. For, for some people have will establish their ethnic identity in the big cities. They didn't want to show their ethnic identity at all. And uh, we, we interviewed one businessman from Zhejiang province, okay? And he lived in Zhejiang, uh, Wenzhou, Zhejiang for, for five years. And all the families moved to Zhejiang. And during my interview with him for the first time, he didn't want to say anything. He didn't want to say, touch any topic about his ethnic culture. Mm -hmm. And later on, uh, following my, my, my own observation and interview with him, I recognized Ethnic culture basically is a stigmatized kind of mark to his life and identity at all. And he didn't want to talk a little bit about that. At the first instant, I feel, I myself, when I'm doing the interview, I myself feel a little bit um, frustrated, disappointed, just because he didn't want to talk the topic. Didn't want to answer my question at all. But later on, I, 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 can, I recognized his way of saying, his way of speaking, definitely is a way of how he want to representing, represent his ethnic culture. That's, that's a very interesting kind of thing for me. So there's many interesting things that I encountered. And basically for that part of research, I draw on um, Anna Dafina's um, um, uh, interactional kind of uh, approach uh, for narrative analysis to understand it, the narratives constructed in the interview rather than take the interviews as a sole uh, source of, um, of information or sole source of, of, of reality at all. So this is what I'm what basically the story behind for that part of research. And because of the time, I didn't have any, any, any time. I didn't touch that in, my, in today's talk at all. Mm. Okay. okay. Thank you. So we've got some uh, questions in the um, QE uh, area. Um, I don't know if you can read it. Uh, first from Chair about, uh, thank you so much for the interesting talk, Professor Wang. This might be a very general question. I'm curious. Yeah whether you notice any intergenerational differences. Yes, so yes, exactly. I, so. yeah, I can talk a little bit more. Thank you for the question. And uh, what I observed, just as I mentioned to you now, and um, I categorized uh, the villages, local villages into three groups. And the first of group is mainly um, um, uh, senior people above 40 years old. And they, they basically, from the appearance you can see, they are wearing the traditional, wearing the traditional coat. And, and you can see from the picture, if you can recall, I can show you a picture. I interview the local villagers there, you can see. And I'm talking with a very senior uh, villagers. And he is wearing the traditional ethnic clothing. For the other younger people in the 30s, 20s, they're all wearing modern hand people. You can't tell 
if you meet such people in the city areas, you, you can't tell his ethnic uh, camp people at all. No. So the most obvious kind of um, identity that they represent is that in terms of language, senior people are um, having basically a much stronger kind of identification sense of their ethnic identity. And uh, they're speaking the local Kan language much better than the younger generation. And they have a very strong sense of political um, tradition. That means um, nervousness. Okay. When I'm talking about, for example, whether or not there's a clear kind of um, 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 uh, inter uh, ethnic, interracial kind of uh, discrimination against each other, something like, um, you know, uh, uh, Han people, whether or not you have been. Um, looked down upon by him or something like that. They have a very strong sense of, you know, awareness that they they need to speak um, in line with the government discourse. Okay, in line with this is for the older generation. For younger generation, much opener, opener. I mean, for the younger generation, they got a strong sense of ethnic identity. At the same time, they have a strong sense to challenge their identity. They're not afraid of saying that they have been discriminated in the factories in Guangdong or Zhejiang. They're not afraid of speaking out. Uh, they feel very embarrassed when they can't speak Mandarin well when they first enter the factories, manufacturing factories at home. So they have strong sense. They can, they can use WeChat. They can use um, uh, uh, the social media fairly well. They are to show their SDI. They, they also, they understand how to use, how to make use of their identity to, to make a living. So that's some interesting kind of intergenerational kind of differences. Very clear kind of intergenerational differences among the people there, definitely true. Interesting, okay. So I have another question from uh, Yue Yang Kong. I have a question regarding the local villagers did not follow the top-down process from the government. Do you mind explaining what's, what top, the top-down top down process was? Okay. Yeah, okay. For the top-down approach, just now I mentioned um, the first and uh, the foremost kind of thing is um, the key framing. Basically, uh, what, what, what the government tried to do is try to build up a kind of um, key identity by each individual with each individual village or town there. And a very clear kind of uh, objection of, among these is just I mentioned at the beginning of my talk is about the wooden building. For the wooden building, the local government say the top-down kind of approach, they say they, they have a policy, no concrete building can be built in the village just to, to preserve the traditional village there. But, a very strong sense of development, meaning all the local people want to be bred into modernity. They didn't want to stay in their, uh, their backward, you know, very poor kind of building. Here. They want to enjoy the modern life, in other words. So they have the, on one hand, they didn't want to go against the government directly in face. On the other, they tried to find a way to really develop their own life. So they, this is a kind of <laughs> approach that is uh, wisdom of local people. They build a concrete kind of internal structure <laughs> within these wooden arterials there. So there's various kinds of ways they try to, uh, definitely this kind of tension, this kind of conflict, hidden conflict between ethnic groups definitely exists. Yeah, you can, you can tell. When you, the more you get into the village culture, the more you can sense this kind of tension, the more you can sense. But the local people basically at, on service, when they talk with us, when they are taking our interviews, they definitely are not trying to, you know, confront with uh, the local government face by face, face to face. No, they have their own ways of living. This is what I try to say. Okay. okay. So I have another question from Rui Yang. Uh, 
Thank you so much for the talk. The topic is so interesting, but I'm kind of sad to know that the history I got to know during the traveling is fabricated. Here are my questions. <laughs> uh, various layers of government uh, different in their discourse and how do they comply, negotiate, collaborate, or conflict with each other. And also is that you mentioned the government is introducing the ethnic, ethnic culture mm -hmm. in curriculum. Yeah. I would like to know young people's view of their ethnic identity and uh, okay. how are they negotiating with it in, in a school setting. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, thank you, Rui. A very, very, um, very good kind of question here. So it's two parts. The first is various layers of government, how they, how they uh, uh, collaborate or negotiate with each other with this kind of um, um, uh, construction of discursive uh, practice. I can tell you the truth. Basically, um, um, for the subordinate governments, they try to comply with the superior governments in various kinds of ways. But there's clear kind of conflicts, chaotic, messy situations, you can tell. Especially, for example, just now I show you the statue of an ancestral kind of history of that village, right? I identified this kind of elite fabrication of the history there. I can tell you the truth. And when I get into the, uh, the um, local government's um, local history office, uh, I, I interview the people in the and get the document from, from the local history, what they've written down here. And what being written down in the history of the county government definitely go against what being established in the village there. So it's not totally aligned with each other. It's totally messy. For the, for the local government, they know very clearly the local people are fabricating their history there. But for the purpose of uh, attracting tourism, they didn't say, no, no, no. They didn't say no to the local elites at all. They still let it go. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So this, the, these kind of um, collaboration and negotiation really exists. And basically, the subordinate uh, governments try to comply with what being said, what being told by the superior government. But sometimes, because of um, the purpose, just I mentioned, like to, to, to promote, to, in, uh, to, to attract more tourism, uh, tourists. So they, they didn't prohibit the elite kind of fabrication. This is the first question. Second, about the schooling, school curriculum. I can, I can tell you, um, this is a very um, important and uh, uh, very controversial field for discourse conflicting, if I like to call it, you know, as different teachers, different uh, schools have different attitude towards introducing ethnic culture into, into local curriculum there, into local curriculum. For the young people's point of view, I can tell you, even within one classroom, there's various kind of ethnic groups. Could be when, I, when we visit the Chongjiang, Mingzhu uh, Zhongxue, Chongjiang Ethnic uh, Minority High School. In one class, there's Han people, there's Miao people, there's Dong people, or Yao people, okay? What kinds of ethnic culture being introduced there? Now, the government say, for example, for Dong Zhu Da Ge, okay, Dong uh, Grand Choir, just because it's an uh, intangible cultural heritage kind of thing. It's a UNESCO designated intangible culture. So definitely being introduced there. But for the, for, the, uh, for the male people, for the male students, they feel uncomfortable. Why we're singing your, 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 your Dong people's song there? And for, for the younger, for people at younger age, they didn't have this kind of awareness. But we encounter, we interview one student in the, in the, in the class. Eh? Why I feel so weird? Why I'm we're seeing Dong Sam in our college rather than introducing Miao Sam in our college in in our, into the school? So there's various kind of attitude, and basically here for the young people, they uh, we have um, observed a very clear prevalence of the girls. Girls 
since they're good at singing, most of the girls feel uh, singing songs is good for them. They can make money, make a living later on, okay, by joining a choir group later on in big cities. That could be taken as a way for them to join the urban life later on in the, in the later life. So that's uh, interesting. So it differ, what I can tell you is the attitude differ largely between each other because of their ethnic uh, background, because of their age, because of their life experience, because of family background, there's kind of factors playing on there. So school curriculum could be a big area, okay? I, I didn't research much um, in this field. I, I feel that area definitely this kind of discursive practice conflicts, okay? Could be an interesting field for further study. Thank you. Okay. So there are a couple of questions from uh, Hai Ping. Uh, um, so one is, um, do local Khan people make efforts to preserve their dialect or language as a means to maintain their ethnic identity? So it's about language um, preservation. And second one is, are there any conflicts between the government's Kate frame of the local cultural identity and the ordinary kind people's understanding of it. Okay, so, thank you. Thank you, uh, Hai Ping. Well, first question I can tell you for the older generation, they take a local uh, can language, just as I mentioned, there's no written language there, just oral. And uh, uh, the senior people definitely taking, uh, keeping um, the, the, their own language as a very important kind of way to maintain their ethnic identity. Okay, for sure. Just because still can language is the main language. It's the main language dominate their social life there in the village. They, they uh, for quite a lot of, especially for female seniors, they can only speak can dialects rather than Mandarin at all. Okay. I have three uh, RA, just one RA uh, can speak a local can. I myself can't speak. I don't understand can at all. And um, we feel very difficult to communicate with the senior female villagers. That group, as I just mentioned to you, uh, I, I categorize three groups of local villagers, but the first group are the seniors. For the senior people, we only secure 10 senior male participants for, for my research. No female seniors at all, except our, our invitation. Because of what? Because of lack of language competency and the traditional culture that the senior females are reluctant to, 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 to be interviewed, be talking with outsiders at all. So you can see very clearly local dialects, local can, dial uh, can, uh, can language has a real value in the local community as a kind of key symbol of their, of their ethnic culture for sure. So um, I'm quite certain that this kind of can language can still be maintained, be preserved for a very, very long time. Even now, this kind of association, uh, assimilization, integration is, um, is speeding for quite a while. The second question, uh, conflicts. As I mentioned to you, uh, of course, there's conflicts there, but you can see very strong kind of power of uh, government of the state in China. You can tell as a student studying Chinese, you can tell very clearly. And the, the, the power, the authority of the Chinese government is very strong, very strong. And um, uh, the local um, camp people, they have some objections, uh, resistance there for sure, for sure. But after year by year, they gradually accept this kind of framing what I observed is that, okay? Even for the first time I went to this village is um, 2016, okay? About uh, up to now 16 years, uh, six years ago. And um, uh, the last time I visited the village is 2019, uh, November 2019, after three years time, okay? I visited there. I talked with the same people. I can feel that, um, for example, the mystery, the nurturing heart, okay? the way they conceptualize the herb, the mysterious kind of herb, this kind of way of, of framing being gradually accepted by the majority of villagers there. Although at first they feel uncomfortable in some way. For example, 
I can tell you just because the statue, uh, the establishment of the statue there, okay, we can tell, we can tell as um, a researcher that they are fabricating, right? But gradually, gradually, just because the statue is there, all right? So this kind of stories spread word by word, okay? Mouth by word, mouth. So this kind of words spread very widely. The people take it as a reality. That's a real truth. I can tell you all the history. Very interesting. Okay, the people, the younger generation didn't know. They can't tell whether or not what is the origin of, of, the, of the village. Okay, they can't tell. There's no written document say, this is the other way wrong rather than this way. What being, you know, written on the statue there. So these kind of conflicts, if existing, definitely lessen gradually, I can tell you the truth. That's a reality in the, in, in the real village there. That's from my own observation research. Thank you. Great, I guess language can create a reality. Yeah, uh, yes, This definitely. one's from ASMIC, uh, uh, Kanda Marian. And uh, the question is also about the younger generation's uh, uh, identity. Um, so I think this is a more specific in the revival of the local identity um, to the local, you know, younger generation, yes. Yes. you know, do this through fashion or any, another means uh, like yes. media. Yes, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Asmik. Uh, very good observation. Very good. Exactly so. I can tell you just now I mentioned the younger generation got a clear kind of awareness of way of how they can represent their identity in what kind of way, when and where they should wear their traditional ethnic costume, for example. Okay, I can tell you, we, we observed, uh, uh, we interviewed one young guy, okay, in the village. And at that time, when I interviewed in the village, he is wearing a Han costume, Han clothing. Okay, you can't tell he's uh, local camp people. Definitely all the people living in that village are camp for sure, I know. But when I interview him in the village, he didn't wear a costume at all. But later on, I interview him in uh, Guiyang, the provincial city of Guizhou province, later on, just because he's working there. And for that occasion, uh, that is, uh, uh, um, uh, um, a carnival, an uh, ethnic uh, culture carnival. He's wearing a very beautifully done fashion, okay, fully dressed in, in, in the ethnic costume there. Okay, so by that, he tried to uh, distinguish uh, himself from others. He tried to tell other people, I'm a cat. Okay, I'm a cat. So they, they definitely know when and how they should highlight their ethnic culture, by what kind of way. They, for the younger, this is a totally a different from, from um, uh, generation to generation, as I just mentioned. It's clearly so. And uh, for the younger generation, especially those who are still rely their life on their ethnic identity, definitely they know how to manipulate their way of doing how to, um, to, to represent their culture, uh, to represent their ethnic culture and identity here. That's absolutely true. The uh, next um, question is from uh, Ji Hua, uh, Xiao Ji Hua, our former UCLA alumna. And she's from Taiwan. She does social linguist work and she yeah. has done uh, field work in mainland China before. Yeah, good. And uh, Hai Ji Hua, <laughs> she's uh, in Taiwan right now. Yeah. Uh, she's interested in, I think there's, you have touched on this, but the, yeah. you know, the grand narratives on Chongjiang as a heart nourishing paradise created yeah. by the central government, yeah. the Guizhou government yeah. influenced yeah. local yeah. people's yeah. life. How does that narrative, you know, um, impact the local people's lives um, and how you know, ordinary people's everyday life is impacted by this and how the you know Kate framing yeah. um, part of their lives or do they yeah. love you know living with this kind of framing <laughs> this particular you know yeah, 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 yeah. okay that's good Chihua, thank you and um, as a social linguist 
I definitely you know the works of um, uh, uh, Goldfang's work there uh, for the key framing. And I think the local government um, ha has already used this kind of uh, key framing very well um, on one side to really crystallize the key themes, key concepts. And as this kind, I can tell you, uh, they, it took um, the, 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 the local government quite a long uh, time and efforts to come up with these kind of frames. Okay, it's not an easy decision to, to, to make up these kind of frames at all. And for the local, local people, and uh, you need to differentiate what kind of local people we are referring to. If it's a local people closely related to the tourism development, for example, they try to highlight, they try to promote, advocate this kind of key frame. This kind of key frame definitely impact the life deeply. Okay, they try to use this kind of frame to promote their, their village, their county, their city in various kind of ways. And they, they are definitely an advocates of this kind of key frame. So for th that group of people, that group of local people, definitely this kind of key frame is part of their life for sure, for sure. But for the local people who are distant away in terms of profession, career, family life from tourism, for example, they have an established kind of career, for example, as a, as a, as a, as a doctor, as a medical doctor, or as, a, as a, some profession, as a businessman, just as I mentioned to you before, okay? They have no sense of this kind of so-called key frame at all. They didn't want to talk about that. Nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with them at all. They don't think this is something, you know, uh, really part of their life. So it differed people by people. Who we're talking about? Who... Um, you know, just as I mentioned to you, I interviewed one businessman in, in Zhejiang, in Wenzhou, who originated from that village, originated from that village. And I interviewed him and the family three times myself. And every time, and he didn't want to talk about his ethnic identity. And I even, he didn't know this kind of so-called kid framing at all. Nothing to do with him. So, it's very hard to say whether or not it's part of their life. It depends on their own background, their life experience, their current life, you know, as whether or not their current career, their way of living is really part of these huge processes. Mm -hmm. This is what I observed. Thank you. Sure. Okay. The next question is from uh, Yiren. Uh, she's interested in the, again, the you know, linguistic identity of the younger generation. Um, this is about code switching for the bilingual speakers who are fluent yeah. in both the local language and Mandarin. Uh, have you noticed any code switching uh, yeah. or code switching patterns in your interaction with the yeah. local younger uh, speakers? Generation. Yes, that's true. There's, um, uh, there are obvious kind of code switching there um, and uh, during uh, our, our interview with them, I can tell. But I, I didn't recognize any specific kind of pattern up to now. I, I, didn't, I didn't do a very detailed kind of analysis. But in my memory, I can tell, for example, for some specific terms uh, using um, by um, uh, um, common uh, camp people, for example, I can give you one example there. When they're talking about uh, Han carders being sent to their local village, okay, there's quite a lot of, you know, Sent uh, uh, carders, meaning um, sent in by the local government to 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 be uh, the village um, party secretary or something like that, you know, um, uh, and uh, uh, school teachers as well, mm, um, namely by Han. Uh, this kind of position, namely occupied by Han carders. When the local people got a turn to 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 refer to that group of people, I I can remember there's a, they called Kerja in the Khan language. When they try to refer to that specific group, they always say Kerja. They never say, at the very first, I get very confused what is Kerja. Kerja, by in term of Chinese, I call <laughs> some guests, right? <laughs> Something like that. But this kind of code switching is because of their awareness or they try to avoid this kind of um, confrontation 
the interracial confrontation in some way. Okay, this is not, um, um, they purposely avoid the direct Hanzu uh, or, you know, Ganbu or something, you know, more directly. They purposely use their, their Kan language to refer to that specific group of people. So something like this, very obviously, after years of interview with that group of people, I understand what they're talking about, literally. But I understand why they're using that kind of code switching in that specific situation. They didn't want to have this kind of very confrontational kind of way of speaking when they're referring to Han people. Yeah. Interesting. Yes. Well, so, um, no other questions posted here. I guess I have a, maybe a final question, a very small, you know, terminological question. So in the uh, Mandarin, it's called the uh, Dongzhu, uh, yeah. whereas in Kan, I guess that's their native language, the name yeah. they use to describe themselves. Yeah. So why there is such a difference? Uh, you know, why the Han um, people use the don't to describe you know, yeah. uh, this group of ethnic people. Uh, yeah. This is very much related to the long history of ethnic classification there, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Trace back to 1950s, okay? First, let, let me talk about the concept of Kan. Kan is English word, basically. If you look at uh, Wikipedia, you can see the origin of Kan. Why? Can is a term that used by the local people to referring to themselves. Basically, they say gang, the gang, G E N or gang. Or, or English people, maybe the first um, uh, the, the uh, anthropologist, the English anthropologist referring to, I don't know who is an anthropologist, referring to that group of people using the term K A N to refer to that group. And this is the origin of can. But for Dong, that's another, totally another thing. For Dong is a term that designated by the central government to describe a group of Kan people, various kind of Kan. And mm -hmm. I can tell you, uh, share with you a, 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 a basic kind of knowledge about uh, the ethnic classification. After the establishment of New China in 1949, and the first step, um, that the, the central government want to uh, classify the ethnic groups. The first step they took is a self nominalization meaning ask the various kind of groups to nominalize themselves, which ethnic group you should belong to. Mm -hmm. And do you know how many ethnic groups they, they nominated themselves? At the 1950s, more than 400 ethnic group being self-dominated, 400 more than 400. At that stage, the central government built up a committee actually mainly chaired by Fei Xiaotong. Fei Xiaotong is a very famous uh, Chinese anthropologist and a very, very famous one and very influential in the world as well. And Fei Xiaotong got his PhD from Can uh, Cambridge University, <laughs> sorry, Cambridge. Anyway, he uh, led a group of scholars and um, provide a key consultation to a central government to say how we can really do this kind of ethnic classification. So ethnic classification is a way actually stipulated, uh, operated by the central government. The term Dong is a term given to such groups of people combined together. They thought they got similarities in terms of language, similarities in terms of culture, costume, um, um, customs, whatever. So I can tell you, um, in my understanding, different groups of currently called the Dong people, they can't communicate with each other, with each other by their own local dialects at all. <laughs> they are not a hygienist kind of group of people at all. So that's Dong is just a term given by the central government to a group of people sharing a similar kind of language or culture or history. That's the term coming from. So I prefer to use can rather than don't in my research. That's a reason.
when you see a group of people, are they peoples or just uh, you know like regional differences? Are they do they believe they are se- ethnically separated? You know, they believe themselves still. They, now, uh, for some group, for example, for some group in uh, in uh, Chongjiang, Rongjiang, um, uh, they they are the origin of Cam Grand Choir, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, they've been called uh, um, uh, some group being called uh, 北洞 or 南洞, okay? And uh, now just because all of them being classified as 洞, so they have to be recognized, identified themselves as 洞. Mm-hmm. But for the people um, from, for example, um, Hunan, they identify them as 洞 as well, okay? And when we interview people in Beijing, and in uh, in Beijing, there's a very large uh, uh, camp, uh, Dong, Dong uh, ground choir group in Beijing now operating there. And for some of the members of that uh, choir group, we interview people, and they they are actually from Hunan. Actually, they don't know how to song, uh, how to sing the the the, the Dong choir at all in their home uh, homeland, and they're they're speaking a different dialects and um, who are not understandable by the people from Chongjiang at all. But they have been identified as Dong, and they recognize them as Dong. They try to join this kind of Dong uh, grand choir, and they become a member. They learn to how to sing the song there. You see? So that's, <laughs> that's anyway. Mm-hmm. And in, in terms of law, okay, legally, they have been identified as Dong for sure. No problem at all. Okay, no problem. But in real practice, I don't know, but you know, that's a very complex kind of situation. Whether for, for, for the central government, definitely they didn't want to, you know, further clarify them. That's a way to have a, a unitary kind of multi ethnic state. That's a policy, it's a government policy. They didn't want to further differentiate them at all. No, <laughs> that's, that's a reality. Okay, great. I guess our time is up. Uh, let me uh, conclude by thanking Dr. Wang for such an illuminating topic. Uh, it's not very common for us to hear about you know, language, culture, the social you know, identity issues in uh, ethnic you know, minority groups in China. So this is such a rare you know, topic and an interesting talk. So thank you so much for speaking to us from Sydney and uh, hope to, you know, someday we'll, you know, uh, meet in person you know, here in, LA, in Sydney. <laughs> yeah. uh, so. Once yeah. the pandemic, you know, is uh, gone, hopefully soon. So thank you again. And um, thanks everyone for your participation. Um, okay. We'll, thank you know, uh, uh, hopefully we'll hear, you know, more you know, research from you um, some other time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tao. Thank you, everyone, for participating in today's session.